Well, boys and girls, we are back in the book of Romans. If you've been keeping along with us, you'll see we're in chapter 9. Chapter 9, speaking about Israel and God's dealings with them, their past, their present, and their future in chapters 9, 10, and 11. So as we go through, the topic on the table today for our learning is the sovereignty of God, where God's the boss. He's the boss of everything. He's the progenitor. He's the one who's created everything. He is the one who causes us to live and move and have our being. He is the one that we owe everything to. And because of that, when we read through the scriptures, our American minds and our independent rebellious natures take umbrage with God's sovereignty. Who is God? to tell me what to do. He can't tell me what to do. I have choice. I have will. Over and above God? Well, we're going to have to we're going to have to see what the scripture says about that. God's sovereign choosing. We're going to look at verses 14 to 33. I know it's a lot of verses. I'm going to speak really quick, so follow along. Romans 9, 16 says, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. In other words, without God, there's nothing you can do. That's worth anything. I always feel that way about a treadmill at the gym. <laughs> Just makes me feel miserable, and I go nowhere. It's supposed to be helpful for some people. Well, just to remind you where we are in the book of Romans, we're here in chapter 9, the second half of chapter 9, which is Israel's past, and we're going to look at them as an example. If you remember in chapter 8, which is kind of the pinnacle of the Romans, it says this in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. If you believe it, tell me, amen. Amen. You are free. Sin no longer controls you. Death no longer tells you what to do. You are no longer controlled by your sinful nature. You've been made new in Christ. Verse 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If you believe that, give me an amen. Amen. God works everything out for your good. Really? You mean you can't mess it up? No. Because that all things means all things. And in verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? And the answer is No, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So there's no condemnation. All things work together for good and nothing can separate us from the love of God. Is that good news? That's the best news I've ever heard. And then we get to chapter nine. (laughs) And the question is, if that's the case, what do you do with Israel? Because Israel was chosen by God We have seen a lineage all the way through the Bible. The Bible is all about the people of the land and about God. Those are the three things that it covers. And you're going to see that it goes through and it follows a very particular lineage that God puts his finger on certain people throughout history and he's trying to accomplish something, which is the bringing of Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, well, what about Israel? If these things are true, if nothing can separate us from the love of God, if all things work together for good and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then what did God do with Israel? Didn't he make a covenant with them? Didn't he promise them that he'd be, they would be his special people? Didn't he say, I have a purpose and a plan for you? Of course he did. Well, what the heck happened? Well, it's important that we think about that. Here, Paul, mourning the condition of his people as they've turned their back on Christ and certainly were instrumental in hanging Christ on the cross, Verse 1, I tell you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. This is, this is a good heart. For I could wish that I myself were 
accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who was over all the eternally blessed God. The Bible just called Jesus the eternally blessed God. Just thought I'd point it out to you. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel, which means governed by God, who are Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh that are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even your father Isaac, for the children not yet being born and having done nothing good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated." Before they did anything good or bad, God chose one over the other. And so when you look at that, you go, that's unfair. It's unfair to choose one over another for no reason, nothing that they did. Before they did anything, God chose one over the other. And he chose the younger over the older. And he, he does that. He kind of shuffles the deck a lot throughout the scriptures. And he picks the most un qualified candidate, much like our, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my, my sarcastic side started to ooze. Like so many things in this world, the most unlikely of candidates. So how unfair is it that God chooses one over the other, regardless of what they've done, in fact, before they ever did anything? In fact, you know when it says that God chose you? Before the foundations of the world, before your atoms had come together, before the earth and the substance of it were in existence, he chose you. He knew you because God's choosing is tied together with this character, which involves his foreknowledge, which doesn't mean that he fast forwards in time to see what you would do. And then he goes, yeah, I'm going to pick him because he's good. Or I'm going to pick her because she's good. But he does it with foreknowledge. And it's amazing. He always chooses rightly. Not perfectly, because none of us is perfect. And yet, God ultimately chooses. How many of you are uncomfortable with this very topic? Wow, that's less than I thought there would be. That God just picks people. Yeah, you, like a kickball game. And not based upon whether you can kick the ball. Well, let's look at the scriptures. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Well, certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay? from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of his wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of his mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us 
whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said of them, you are not my people, that they shall be called the sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it, off, cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. As for Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the Sabaoth or the hosts had left us the seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. How many of you are overwhelmed? I'm so glad. Because that means I still have a job. What shall we say if, if God is choosing Jacob over Esau before they did anything good or bad, if God sovereignly chooses before they're born, regardless of what they've done, then we know it's by God's grace, right? We all agree with that aspect. But he chooses one over the other. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God if he chooses one over the other, regardless of what they've done? That doesn't seem fair. I don't know about you, but that was like the first word I ever heard my kids scream at me. Not fair. Have you ever heard those? <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> she gets to stay up later than me. My son would say that because my daughter's two years older. And we'd let her stay up a little bit later. And he was, <laughs> they couldn't keep his eyes open. and needed to go to bed anyway. It's not fair. Well, who says? The little child who has to go to bed. And very often we're like that little child when we cry out to God and say not fair because we don't have an understanding of what we say. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I have, I have compassion. Well, that doesn't sound fair to me. If you remember, this was said in the context of Moses coming back down from getting the Ten Commandments, and presenting them to Israel. As he came down, Israel is in the middle of a giant romp. I'll PJ it. Uh, PG it. They were in, in the midst of non-social distancing. <laughs> and they were sinning against God. Not only that, but they took all their gold and everything that they had, and they gave it to Aaron, and Aaron fashioned them a calf in which they worshiped. And they said, this calf is the one that delivered us. You know, you can't leave the kids along, alone for too long. They just do things, you know. Moses comes down and he goes, wait a minute, it's the sound of war. And it's like, no, no, it's revelry. It's a party. It's a crazy time. And he goes down and Moses breaks the Ten Commandments, literally, in his anger. And God tells Moses, stand aside, I'll take care of him. And Moses goes, no, 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 don't do that. This is the Jersey version. <laughs> don't do that. And he goes, don't worry about it, Moses. I'll raise up a whole new line of people from you. He's 80 years old. He's got to get busy. <laughs> and he says, Lord, if you're going to wipe them out, just, just wipe me out too. And what are the nations going to say about you, that you delivered these people from Egypt and brought them out here just to kill them? What about your name? What about your reputation? And then the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. What did they deserve? Utter destruction. What did he give them? 
mercy. God shows mercy on whomever he wants to show mercy. And we think that's unfair. You know what's fair? Wiping us all out like so many bad doodles on a chalkboard. That's what God should do. For the sins in our heart because of the corruptness of our natures, because of the imaginations of our minds that, that just desire, you know, twisted things and the things that the devil has done to us, our DNA is contaminated. He should wipe us all out like, like, uh, like the Rona, the coronavirus. I, that's the nickname. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. God is never less than fair with anyone, but he fully reserves the right to be more than fair with individuals as he chooses. Uh, David Guzik said that. I don't know if he stole it from somebody, but he said it. And I think it's very profound. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not something that we deserve or that we should have. What we should have is destruction. Don't cry out for justice because you don't want to get that. You want mercy. God is never less than fair with anyone, but fully reserves the right to be more than fair with individuals he chooses. You do the same thing. Did you send Christmas cards to everyone? <sighs> Maybe I didn't even get one from you. Did you have everyone over for Christmas? Did you spend New Year's with everyone? Or do you get to pick and choose? Do you get to choose who you spend time with? Who you have meals with? Who you buy gifts for? Do you get to choose that? So you choose to be more than fair. And it's funny, we fault God for doing the same thing we do all the time. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, talks about laborers in a vineyard, which gives a very good example of this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, by the way, that's the average daily thing that you would pick somebody up at 7-Eleven and pay them. None of you have ever done this, apparently. He agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, and he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others still standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into my vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give to you. And so they went. And again, he went out at the sixth hour. And the ninth hour, he did likewise. At about the 11th hour, by the way, this is a 12-hour work day. Sun up, sun down. For all, all you people who don't have that. Unless you're working from home, and then it is. About the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into my vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, so they only worked an hour, they each received a denarius, which is a full day's pay for working one hour. That's a good deal, right? Where, where do I get that job? <laughs> but when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, but they likewise received each a denarius. And when they received it, they complained against the landowner saying, these last men had worked only one hour and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as I did to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So, 
The last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Hmm. This guy paid the guy who worked an hour a full day's wage. Is that unfair? Silence filled the room that day. <laughs> Mercy is getting what we don't deserve. And God never treats anyone less than fair, but he reserves the right to be more than fair to anyone he chooses. You guys good with that? And the kicker is it's there for the asking. It doesn't matter if you're new to Christ or you've been with the Lord for a million years, you're going to get eternity. And that's what Jesus is talking about. And none of us deserves any of it. So, moving on about God's sovereign choice and about not being fair. Think about this situation here. In John chapter 5, there was the pool of Bethesda and Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he goes, it's, it's Solomon's colonnade and there are these people that are laid at this pool. And it's, it's got the reputation of being a healing pool. Every once in a while, the earth makes some gas. There's some bubbles that come up because it's naturally fed from underground. And everyone supposed, hey, when the bubbles come up, you got to get in because the first one in gets healed. And they supposed an angel came and stirred the water, but there's no proof of any of this. It was just a reputation. It was just a rumor. And yet, Every single day, people would sit around this pool of Bethesda and they would beg and they would wait for the water to be stirred up. And Jesus comes along and looks at all of the false hope of these hurt people and he looks at one guy. There was now a certain man who had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years he's coming to the pool. 38 years he's sitting poolside, waiting for bubbles. You know, there are people doing that, except they go to the bar <laughs> and they're waiting for the perfect thing to just drop into their lap. Well, I'm sorry. 38 years. Now, Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be made well? You don't think there's sarcasm in the Bible? He's laid there 38 years waiting for bubbles. Do you want to get well? That's a good question. Well, I certainly hope I do. I, I would think I wasted 38 years of my life laying here, hoping for the earth to make a little flatulence. And the sick man answered, sir... I have no man to put me into the pool. It's always somebody else's fault when you have trouble. When the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So apparently this has happened before, and he, he was the rotten egg. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Now, that day was a Sabbath, which is dum, 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 trouble. Verse 14, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, see, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Here's the amazing thing. We read that story and we say, wow, that's so awesome. Jesus came, saw the sky, said, pick up your bed and walk. You're sitting here hoping for something that's useless and will never help you. And you're going to wait the rest of your life and you're going to die here by this pool. He could have said all that but he didn't. He just said, pick up your bed and walk. The amazing thing is there were hundreds of people there. Hundreds. Jesus spoke to one. And it was a hit and run. He healed him and took off. And the guy got up and the, the Pharisee said, well, it's the Sabbath. Why are you walking with your bed? You're doing labor. And he says, well, the guy who healed me, you know, I'm the guy that's been laying there for 38 years. He, the guy who healed me said, pick up your bed and walk, so I figured I'd better do what he said. <laughs> he didn't even know it was Jesus. Jesus catches up with him in verse 14, and he says, look, you've been made well. Stop sinning lest the worst thing happen to you. 
And then the guy ran back to the Pharisees. He goes, that's the guy. <laughs> Hundreds of people around the pool. Jesus picked one. Why? Because mercy is getting what you don't deserve. God is never less than fair to anyone, but he reserves the right to be more than fair to anyone he pleases. The thing is, you have that same freedom. Well, moving on, verse 16. So then, it is not of him who wills, it doesn't matter how much you want something, nor of him who runs, which has to do with effort. So it doesn't matter how much you plan it, how much you think about it, how much you hope for it, how much you imagine it, or even what you put into practice, actually what you do. None of those things matter. It's not of him who wills nor him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. How many of you got a problem with that? He rose Pharaoh up to do damage. You remember Yul Brynner, right? So let it be done. So let it be written. So let it be done. As a kid, I was like, that's so cool. I should talk like that. <laughs> he raises up Pharaoh for this very thing. It's interesting. Did he make Pharaoh that way? Or did Pharaoh become that way? Was he nurtured into becoming this really angry person? You know, there was a, it says that a Pharaoh rose up who did not know Joseph and suddenly turned everyone into slaves. Does that sound like a nice guy to you? No, it sounds like a very insecure person. You can't think of God as making somebody angry, wicked, and horrible because God doesn't do that. But he'll let you go. And he'll put you in a place of prominence so that you can do his bidding in your current condition, which is what he did with Pharaoh. He didn't make him that way, but he rose him up and put him in that place where he would be able to do what he did so that God could do what he did. Send 10 plagues, by the way, there are 20 times in the scriptures where it says Pharaoh's heart hardened. Did you know that there are three different Hebrew words for that? <laughs> 10 of those times, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. 10 of the times, God hardened his heart. It's like his heart was already hard and then the Lord just said, okay, go ahead, do what you gotta do. Everything pertaining to God means he made firm. Didn't mean that he hardened his heart. His heart was soft and, you know, I really care for these people. It wasn't like that at all. It was already hard and he just said, go ahead, do what you want to do. And he became resolute. Just so that you don't misunderstand the sense. In Micah 6, 8, it says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That middle one is to love mercy. You know how you can tell if you love mercy? If you show it. When you don't smack somebody who deserves it. When you're not sarcastic with somebody you feel like being sarcastic to because they really, do I want to be made well? What, what kind of question is that? How about a little Humility. Mankind, I think, needs a giant bit of humility. We all have fallen short of the mark, and we all deserve justice, which is to be wiped out from the face of the planet. God has put his image in us, and he's given us everything we need, and we have turned our back on him as a people. Mercy is not a human right. Most people think it's a human right. You know, you ever heard, ever heard people say, well, if this God of yours is real, then... Why do good things, I mean, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? By the way, you know there are, there's no such thing right. as good people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's no such thing as good people, so I don't know what you're talking about. It's an interesting scenario. 
because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have become unprofitable. We have all sought our own way like sheep gone astray. That's who we are. Bad things don't happen to good people. There aren't good people. I'm not a good people. I'm your pastor. It's a confession. I'm a bad man. But Jesus saved me. He's changing me. I, I got a way to go, but we're getting there. It's like playing chess with God. What is a human being's strategy to be if they're playing chess with God? Plead for mercy. <laughs> Put the king over before the game starts. That's the best thing you can do. Because you can't play chess with God because God knows every move and he knows every move you're going to make before you make it. And guess what? He always wins. It's like playing chess with God. Well, God has no right to choose it. Really? Are you playing chess with God? Because that's funny. So what is your strategy? In Luke 14, verse 31 to 33, Jesus, making a parable, explains it this way. Or what king going to war, oh, by the way, this is just after he says you should count the cost. You know, a man who's going to build the tower, he should figure out how much it's going to cost, make sure he's got enough money and labor and time, you know, before winter hits and to build this tower. Because you build this tower halfway and you stop and everybody's going to walk and, and point at it and say, <laughs> that guy's an idiot. You know, that's a builder I will not hire. Right? And then he says this, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. How many of you are confused by that parable? Any of you? Oh, good. Well, I can explain it. By the way, you're the king who has 10,000. God is the one who has 20,000. And if you're going to do war with him, you're going to lose. And so what are you going to do? You're going to plead for mercy. <laughs> hey, God, you're bigger than me. You know more than me. I don't get it. I'm, I'm broken. I need you. Help me. That's what you do. You send a delegation of peace and you say, I, I need to be married with you because I cannot fight you. That's our position. It's not our position to say, well, God, you're not fair. God can do whatever he wants to do. He created us. We walk on bugs. We plant grass and then we cut it. We plant grass and we cut it. If the grass could speak to you, it might say, not fair. I don't get a chance to grow. You're serving my purpose and you're doing what I wish you to do. I want you to be a lawn. We do it all the time. Don't think anything of it. How much bigger is God compared to you and grass? I rest my case. All right. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm positively giving, giddy today. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? If God chooses people and he doesn't choose other people, then who's going who's to stand before God and say, hey, God, why do you blame me for the things I did? Why do you point your finger at me and say I'm guilty of, you know, lust and adultery and stealing and murder? And, you know, why are you pointing the finger at me since... I couldn't do anything else but dance to my DNA. So why, why are you holding me accountable, God? Isn't that the natural question? If God chooses and picks, then why would he hold anyone accountable for their sin? Doesn't it make you go, hmm? Because there is going to be a great white throne judgment. It says here in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened 
And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. If God chooses some and he doesn't choose other, how does he have a right to judge anyone for their deeds? Any of you have trouble reconciling those things? No. Okay, good. Well, I'm done. <laughs> Verse 20, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Does God have the right to take the same dust that makes up the earth and breathe into it the breath of life and create a living being? Doesn't he have a right to do that and leave the rest of it for your lawn? He certainly does. The same vessel, by the way, that's a wonderful vase right there. It's a Qinglong Dynasty vase, <laughs> which sold for $18 million. You know what it's made out of? Nothing special. It just looks pretty, which means you need to have $18 million to own this thing. This... Same material. One is for honor. One is for dishonor. Especially if you have to get your face in one. Those of you who had COVID, maybe you were sick to your stomach, maybe you remember this. Honor, dishonor, made out of the same lump. Doesn't it fall with the person who made the thing to declare what the thing should be used for? And yet, we don't think that way about God. We don't think that he is absolute reign and rule in our lives. We're glad to say, hey, listen, I'm saved by grace. But we like to prove that God made a good choice. <laughs> right? Now, unless you get one like that. <laughs> now, that is a throne. <laughs> by the way, you can get that thing for $2,000 and the shipping's free. And you know what that's made out of? The same material. <laughs> they just put some gold on the outside. That's all it is. So, you can check it out on Amazon. <laughs> Verse 22. What if God, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory even to whom us whom he called not the Jews only but also the Gentiles Paul find a period <laughs> what if god wanted to show his wrath because when somebody does something wrong, they should be punished. Somebody goes through a stop sign, they should be pulled over. Somebody goes through a red light, should get pulled over. Somebody that's going 95 miles an hour and leaves me in the dust should definitely get pulled over. <laughs> right? Don't you have this sense that if somebody does something wrong, they should be punished, it should be exposed, it should be, I should be recording this and I should put it on the internet? I mean, isn't that what we want is justice? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with long-suffering the vessels of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he held his breath? You know, there are instances in the scripture, there's the Amorites. The Amorites in the Old Testament were evil people, and the prophets were like, come on, God, can't you take these people out? He goes, they haven't reached their quota yet. It will be in 400 years. You see, God's got it all worked out, and he knows when they've reached the level where he's going to say, that's it, enough. And there's a time when Jesus is coming back for us, Amen. and he's going to say, enough. I don't think it's quite yet, but you can see we're getting closer. Yes. What if God wanted to show his wrath to make his power known, endured with long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of his mercy. 
What if God wanted to do that? Could he do that? Which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. So what if God wanted to be patient? With some of the people in your life, you're like, God, why don't you take these people out? <laughs> take them out. Like this whole election thing? Just take it out. You know, you know the truth, right? Well, why don't you do something? What if God, in his patience, wanting to pour out wrath so that he might show his glory to the vessels of his mercy, what if he just was patient? Would you have a problem with that? I wonder how many of you, if Jesus came 10 years ago, would be here in Christ. What if everything is done so that we might know him? What if everything in your life was designed so that you might get to know him? I think that's what it is. What if all of life could be summed up in this? God is reaching out to you and speaking to you and speaking to you about his mercy and his love and everything he does. If you get, how many of you had coronavirus? You don't have to raise your hand if you're shy about it. What if God allowed all of that so that you might have an intimate relationship with him through Jesus Christ? It's a good idea. It's actually mind blowing. <laughs> like Johnny D does all the time. <laughs> what if he wanted to do that? Guys, we're out of time. I am so sorry. It looked like it wasn't a lot when I was in studying. <sighs> The sovereignty of our God is incredible and he chooses to show us mercy. We are recipients of his mercy and you know what? He tells us to go out and tell the world you have a secret that nobody else knows. It's a secret of eternal life that there are people outside of these walls in this world don't know. Amen. How can you not tell them? Like Paul, I am in anguish every single day about my people. My people, I wish that I could be separated from a life with God, from eternity, so that they might know him. We need to have a heart like that. I pray that this is helpful for you to think through. I know it's some mental gymnastics and some heavy theology. Uh, hopefully we're making it interesting for you. And I just have to say again, it is so good to see every single one of your faces. Mm -hmm.